everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with Danielle Chason, and we're going to be talking all about how to tap into your RRSPs to invest in real estate. I know this is a very popular topic with so many people because there's a lot of mystery around this topic, and I'm excited that Danielle's here to share her knowledge with you. Before we get into it with Danielle, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit that notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, uh, let's get into it, Danielle. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your busy day to join me. I really do appreciate it. Before we jump in, uh, tell everyone a little bit about you and what you do as an investor. Oh, wow. Yes. Well, I thank you, Darren. First thing, I just want to say thank you for having me and uh, sharing with your audience. I hope that uh, we can teach them a little bit today. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, yeah, real estate investing since uh, 2013, full time as a career. Um, the first two years, I just educated myself. I went down to the States. I hired coaches. I just like legitimately went back to school. That was my mindset. I'm like going back to school, learn a new career. And that's exactly, exactly what I did for two years. Uh, 2015, bought my first flip. That was the plan. I was going to get into flipping. I did that for five years. Um, and then last year with COVID, uh, we had a seven week shutdown in the first wave that we had last April and uh, it gave me time to sit back since I didn't have all these projects, as you know, are very time consuming, Darren, mm -hmm. uh, managing projects. And so I, I had time to sit back and kind of evaluate the course that I was on and um, the, the journey and where I wanted to go. And so I actually pivoted during COVID and decided to just go into acquisitions. So now um, what I'm doing is just strictly acquisitions. Uh, I built the team around me, great partners, um, and we're just focusing on acquiring buy and holds. Let's talk about RRSPs, the, uh, the big elephant in the room, I like to call it sometimes because so many people um, have this product in Canada. Um, they are not utilizing it probably as best as they can. What is the biggest barrier for people when they're looking at that RRSP and why they don't end up hitting their target of being able to use that money in retirement? And why is it oftentimes short of what they expected based on the projections that they were making when they first started investing in their RRSPs and sitting down with their you know, financial advisor, if you will? Well, honestly, Darren, the barrier for people not hitting the targets for what they wanna do in retirement is just a lack of education and understanding. So let me tell you a quick story. When I first bought my first RSPs, I did a, uh, I went into the bank and I did a loan. Uh, I, for, I forget what it was called, like a fast track loan. It was 12 months. And because I wanted to do like, I, I want to max out what I could. And I think I was 23 or 24 at the time. And I hadn't bought RSP. So I had like some rollovers. So I just did a loan, did it over 12 months. And I was asking the person that was doing and setting it up in a mutual fund, I was asking a lot of questions because I'm just a curious type and that's kind of a trait of entrepreneurship. And so I was asking a thousand questions. And I'm like, oh my God, you must get so annoyed having to answer all these questions with back-to-back -back people. And she said to me, she goes, actually, no, most people don't ask anything. Um, you're not the norm. And that was kind of an eye-opener for me. And really, that's what happens. People go into the bank, they say, I want to max out my RSPs because I know that's what I'm supposed to do. And that's what I should be doing. And they mm -hmm. go in and they say, how much can I invest? This is what I can afford. And then that advisor at the branch will say, well, these are the three um, different portfolios. Like, let's just do a quick questionnaire. And then we're going to fit you into one of these portfolios, which is, by the way, a bank product for the bank mm -hmm. that you're dealing with and not necessarily the best product that you could be investing in to get a better return. And so what happens is people just go, okay, great, you know, and then off they go. And that is kind of the typical um, process. And then the following year, now they have a relationship with that person and they go, yeah, just add it to that, just add it to that. And they never revisit it. And I get it because it takes time to understand things. It takes time to educate yourself and learn about it and all the different all the different um, methodologies and different options that you have to play with your registered funds. But I'll tell you right now, what happens is if you went to the bank and said, I wanted to become a lender with this money, they'll tell you you're not allowed because they don't know. They actually don't know. Mm -hmm. The people that are at the bank are trained by the bank and they're trained within their box. And that's it. So the bank trains them on what they want to know, which is that these are the products you're selling. That's it. 
I've had many conversations with people at the branch level. And when I talk about bank, I'm talking about branch level. Their education is limited to what the branch or the bank trains them for that position. So I think there's this, this myth around investing with your RSPs and there's a lot of um, misinformation out there. One of the things that I hear often is you can only invest your RSPs in one time in real estate. And that is through the first time home buyers plan. We as experienced real estate investors know that that's not the case. So what is your best piece of advice? What is your first piece of advice for somebody? If you're saying that's not actually true, here's what you can do with your RSPs in real estate. How should they get started? So the first step that you need to do is you need to take your money and transfer it to a trust company where you can tap into that. Because ultimately most people, the majority of people have gone to the bank at the big bank and then they buy into a registered fund there. So let me explain to you what a registered fund is. It's just an account that is regulated by whoever the account holder is to make sure that it follows the rules of the registered money, okay? So Mm -hmm. that's what you have at the bank. And it is a self-directed account because you're telling the bank where to invest that money, but you're just limited of what you can do because that bank will only have a few products that you can invest that money into. Typically it's a mutual fund within, with their products in that fund. So, mm-hmm. so what we do is we want to transfer that money to a trust company that will give us more freedom to do what we want with that money. They still maintain, they still have to make sure that, and that's what a trust does. They just look and make sure that, okay, what this person is doing with that money is within the rules and regulations of a registered account. That way you get the tax shelter. Um, But what you need to do is you need to go to the trust company, open up an account there, and then apply to have your funds transferred from the conventional bank to the trust company. And then once it's at the trust company, then you have more freedom to do what you want with it and can, can become a lender essentially. To answer your question, the first step is to open an account with a trust company. And there are three, there's a few, but there are top three in Canada that I would recommend. Olympia Trust uh, is one of them, Canadian Western Trust and Community Trust. They're all financial institutions that are trust companies that are regulated by the regulating body for the registered funds. And they're going to make sure that you're you know, doing what you want to do within your uh, within your account to make sure that you're not breaking the rules. So there are rules you need to follow within a registered account for sure. Yeah. And I, and I, 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 I know that I've said this on my channel many times, but I can never say it enough because somebody is hearing this for the very first time. Cause somebody hears transfer their RSPs. They're thinking I got to pay tax on that money because I'm taking my money out of my RSP and I'm in, in depositing into another RSP account. Explain how that works. No, you're just transferring it from one account to another. That's it. It's no different than if I had a business account at RBC and I wanted to open up a business account at CIBC and transfer my money. All I'm doing is transferring from one business account to the other. When it comes to the registered funds, you're transferring the funds from one registered account to another registered account. You're not actually triggering um, um, a withdrawal. It's just Mm -hmm. a transfer of funds from one registered account to another. A friend of mine said, well, if you hear the word withholding tax, you know, stop because there's something that's going wrong there. But um, the other part of of that transfer is uh, what is your suggestion for people on how they should do that? Should they go to the trust company, open up the account and then have them pull those funds or should they go to their branch and say, I'd like to open up and can you move these funds over here? What's the easiest way to do that? So the process is actually really easy, Darren, because all you have to do is open up an account with a trust company. Like I said, maybe let's say Olympia Trust, for example, you open up the registered fund. You just got to make sure if it's an RRSP, you're opening up an RRSP account at Olympia, the trust company. If it's an RESP or if it's a Lira, you just have to have that type of account opened at the trust company. And so you open up, say, the RRSP account at Olympia, and then you just put in an application form to transfer. It's just a form you fill out with them. But here's here's the thing. A lot of people get really freaked out about it because there's a little bit of paperwork and the paperwork can be a little bit daunting. But honestly, guys, it's really not that hard. It's going to take, it could take up to eight weeks to transfer the funds. So uh, depending on the financial institution, because they don't want your money to leave their financial institution. Because again, remember, they're giving you the money. They're holding your money for six to 8% or four to 6% after fees. 
and they're lending it out at 20. So when you think about that, why do they want to give you your money back when they're using your money to make money, right? So they're going to make it a little bit hard. So what's going to happen? This is what happened to me. My financial advisor called me and said, Danielle, you sure you want to do that? It's really risky. Why would you do that? Well, this is what's going to happen. And, and they're going to try to scare the crap out of you. And honestly, um, they're just doing their job. So I don't fault people for doing their job. They're doing what they're trained to do. Again, you just got to understand what their position is. And again, it's that knowledge, understanding where this conversation and advice is coming from. But ultimately, if um, you're aware of it, then you're going to be prepared for that conversation. You're going to be like, nope, I get it. I'm aware. But, you know, I have alternative ways of investing. I want to get a higher rate of return. And I, I do want to move forward with this. And I appreciate you looking out for me. And once that money is with Olympia or Community or, or Canadian Western Trust, I think there is a bit of a um, misconception there as well that you're actually investing in those trust companies. That's not the case. They are basically the trustee of that money. Now, once it's there, you can choose the uh, investment that you want to go out and invest in. How, how, why, why do you think this is so much better than, you know, a standard mutual fund uh, in that, you know, getting into to private lending and things like that, getting into the real estate market with those funds versus the money markets? I'm glad you said that with the money markets, um, because the financial markets is this. the difference between real estate, investing in real estate and investing through the financial market is that you have a little bit more control. Um, the financial markets they go up, they go down, you're fully exposed to that environment and you have no control. And you don't even have any control over uh, what investments you're in. You know, a mutual fund, is, there's a fund manager, they're making all the decisions. You have no control over that. So that's number one, okay, is the exposure to the financial markets. Number two, and, and just to put it into context, the real estate market, when you're a lender and you're taking the position of the bank and you're giving a mortgage to somebody on a property, you're not exposed. You, you could argue, say, well, I'm exposed to the real estate market. Well, not yes and no, but indirectly, because at the end of the day, my loan that I've given, the mortgage that I've given that I've issued to um, a potential homeowner, it, it, the, the terms of that loan is based on a rate of return, period. That rate of return doesn't change. Hmm. So yeah, you're exposed to the real estate market, but it's not you that ex that is exposed. It's the owner that's exposed. You still have a loan agreement with this person that says you owe me 10%, 12%, regardless of what happens in the real estate market. So you kind of have a layer of safety and you're sheltered a little bit from that exposure to the real estate market. You mentioned second mortgages. And I know in the back of a lot of people's minds, they're going to say second mortgage, huge risk in second mortgages. How do you um, combat that? Because it's not necessarily true. It can be, but it's not uh, necessarily true if you're picking the right products. So how do you advise people when it comes to explaining to them how second mortgages can be beneficial for both the borrower and the lender? You're hundred percent right. You know, it can be a risk but you can mitigate that risk just like any investment. So if you look again, if you're vetting the property, you're vetting the investor, you're really minimizing your risk for any second mortgage. And the market is the third thing you need to be looking at. So the area that the property is in, what area it's in, and what's happening in the market at that time. Because really the biggest risk factor is um, a downturn market where the market is going down and the property is losing equity because if it's losing equity, then it's losing that security that you have, which is maybe that last 20% of loan to value that you've, you've done. So you might've done 20 or 30% of the last bit of loan to value. Um, so if the real estate market does go down, your equity is now kind of dwindling. Your security is dwindling, I should say. So, mm. um, so you really want to see what the market is doing, where it's going. As a second position mortgage, you can always say, hey, look, you can talk to this. That's why I like dealing with the lender, the borrowers myself, because then I can talk to them and say, look, let's make a deal. Maybe I pick up the property for less. Maybe I can do some renovations to it and, and save it and you know, protect my money. I like having that control. I don't have control over a mutual fund, but I can control with what's going on with a property. And if I'm dealing with the borrower direct, I can I have that relationship with my borrowers. And so I can maybe help them out a little bit and save them. So I can pay out the first position mortgage. 
uh, and then keep control of that property and rent it out. I mean, it could be renting out and making money still, but the seller or the, the owner is just in a bad financial position. And so maybe I just take control of the property. So there's a lot, there's a lot more you can do. Um, and your mortgage broker will help you with that as well. What's your best piece of advice for people that want to get into investing with their RSPs in, in private lending? Uh, what, what, what do you suggest they do? You know, everybody thinks, okay, they need to fully understand everything that needs to be right. They need to, you don't. All you need to do is open up an account at a trust company, transfer the money, you liquidate the money where your money's at now, get it transferred over into the trust company. And at that point, just work with a broker. You know, if you don't know a lot about real estate, it's okay. Just work with a broker and then get better returns because of the rule of 72. And because I don't trust that the government will have us protected in our retirement. And I know what my grandfather and grandfather are getting right now from the government to live off of. I, I have no faith whatsoever that we will have a comfortable retirement, which is what's driving me to do what I do every day um, mm -hmm. is just so that I have a comfortable retirement. Like, you know, we don't know if we'll have free healthcare forever. What if we don't have free healthcare? Like, are you going to be able to pay for the medicine that you need when you're older, right? Um, we live longer. So that, you know, $1,000, $1,200 a month that the government gives you when you're 63 or 65 is not going to go very far in 25, 30 years because the value of that $1,200, they don't keep giving you more every year with inflation. They don't. They leave yeah. it where it's at. And so you're, that $1,200 is going to be peanuts in 20 years from the time you retire. So I, I just say do it so that you can have, you wanna boost your retirement fund and have a, have a healthier kind of more enjoyable retirement. I mean, we work hard our entire lives um, and you know, in our last days, I wanna enjoy it with my grandkids and spoil them and go on vacations. And I won't be able to do that on government money. So I'm really wanting to like boost my retirement so that I'm able to travel and be comfortable and have the health care that I need because I don't know if they're going to pay for it. I need to know that I can pay for it if I need to. Well, Danielle, that was amazing. I love the breakdown of how we can start to use our RSPs in, in real estate. I think it's something that uh, is a topic that is not often covered. We don't teach this in schools. Uh, it's very important that Canadians and, and everybody really understands this, this method that is available to us. If you guys enjoyed the session with Danielle, which I know you will have, go ahead and do me a favor, hit that like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit that notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. I'd love to hear in the comments section what you're currently doing with your RSP money right now. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenboros.com. With that, I'll say, Danielle, thanks for taking some time out of your day to join me. I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey, and I know that our paths will cross hopefully very soon in person at some point when this <laughs> pandemic is all over and we can get back to our normal lives. <laughs> Thanks Danielle, for taking some it. time. Yeah, awesome. Thanks Thank for having you. me. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank we'll you. We'll talk soon.